All right. Well, I'm uh, Ben Shortcuff. Uh, hi, Kevin. Good to see you, too. Uh, I um, am, uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. It, I feel a little bit out of place. I'm a clinician. I've been in the operating room for a lot of years, but I'm a sort of a brand new at the innovation thing. And, uh, you know, I'll start by saying that in the operating room, I think this is really the key. Uh, in the operating room, there's innovation going on all the time. I mean, we're always seeing things that could improve, but we don't really have a path uh, to take anything forward. We just say, hey, wouldn't it be great if we fixed that or did that or whatever? And then it kind of just ends there. And um, uh, I, th I think I'd still be there if it wasn't for the fact that Dr. Cook happens to have the office next to mine. And, and just like any other day when I happen to come by his office and I said, oh, I did this really cool thing today, it was really neat. All of a sudden, he took me down this path of actually starting to realize uh, kind of a, an invention or an inno innovation that never would have moved anywhere. Anyhow, I think that, you know, I, I'm, I've been blown away by Nobel Prize winning ideas that we've already heard today, um, potentially a cure for cancer, or brand new antibiotic category. These are amazing things. My idea is certainly not on that level. Um, but uh, I think Dr. Cook really wanted me to talk, especially as a novice, about all the resources that are, um, that are at hand for us uh, as clinicians, as staff, as faculty in the university. So just briefly, um, I, I, I work mostly at the cancer hospital. That means, fortunately, I don't do a lot of pediatrics anymore. But occasionally I do pediatric anesthesia. And... Um, one, of the, one of the hallmarks of pediatric anesthesia is that when you walk into a room, this is usually what you see. And uh, it, I mean, for all of us who have kids, who've had kids go through the operating room experience or surgery experience, uh, if we could avoid this, it would be awesome. But the kids are scared, and they have every, every reason to be. I mean, look at the things that we expose them to. They've, they see needles. They, they know they're going to get a shot. They see us in masks. We look like bandits. Um, we kind of come at them from the top in weird angles. We take their clothes away. We put them in cold rooms. We do everything that we can to kind of basically increase the anxiety. Um, and we scare the parents, too. The parents are petrified. And as the parents get petrified, the whole thing kind of spirals up. And the kids get more petrified. And the separation becomes very challenging. We do have medications that help us uh, separate children from the parents and get into the operating room and get them off to sleep. But those medicines, none of them are perfect. In fact, most of them have significant side effects, including for most pediatric surgeries, the, the medicines that we use to, to calm kids down uh, last longer than the surgeries do. So when they wake up after anesthesia, they're still being affected by the medicines we use to calm them down. In addition, the medicines we use cause kids to be confused and, and um, uh, it's harder for them to wake up, grasp, and know that they're safe at the end of a surgery. So when we're done with a procedure, if we've used premedications, the kids are often fussier, harder to, harder to, to calm. Uh, so if we could avoid medicines, that would be ideal. Um, so I've got two kids, and I know that no matter what's going on, if I let them play video games, the whole rest of the world disappears. Um, and so using video games in the operating room has been something that uh, I've played with a lot. Just uh, either I'll bring in my cell phone or, an I or a tablet, let the kids play a video game or watch a movie or sing a song. There's a lot of things that we do to help calm kids down. Um, and then one day I got, I got in my New York Times uh, subscription a free Google Cardboard and I played with it and took it to work with me. And I, let the, I, I used it on a couple kids. I just put a video game on the Google Cardboard and it was like magic. It was frighteningly like an opiate. I mean, it is amazing what a child will let you do if you distract them. And the, and the thing that was even more amazing was it wasn't just the child, but if I gave the child this to completely distract and absorb their attention, the parents calmed down, everybody calmed down. And I could tell the kid, I wasn't sneaking up on the child, I could tell the kid, we're going to go to the operating room now, I want you to keep playing, um, and we're going to get you off to sleep and we'll be done. And it, uh, it allowed me to do a lot of procedures without having to use premedication. So it was, again, frighteningly powerful. Um, I will, so here's just a picture of, of me and Dr. Cook's son. 
uh, just as an, as an example, uh, this is how we would get a kid off to sleep. Uh, just have him sit on my lap. They're, he's playing a video, a little video game. He's kind of looking through the Google Cardboard. And uh, I'm just talking to him, telling him I'm going to have him breathe some anesthesia medicine and get him off to sleep. Uh, so uh, as you can see, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a great idea. I mean, it's a fun idea. And it's, it works. It's incredibly easy. The thing that struck me even more importantly was if I could now just take the next step and get them to play a video game that would, uh, that would encourage them to breathe in some sort of a deep and regular pattern, then um, I would actually, not only would it distract them, but it would facilitate the anesthetic. It would, they have to breathe to get the anesthesia medicines in. So if I could create a video game that would allow them or encourage them to breathe the way I want them to, uh, that, would be, that would be an added bonus. So, so um, Dr. Cook kind of turned me on to all the resources of the hospital. We, um, we have bioengineering, we have financial assistance, we have business and idea development. And it, these things didn't all happen in, um, sequentially. They all kind of happened in parallel. So for the novices like me who never knew that these resources existed, I just want to kind of go through and, and kind of outline th the groups that have helped me so far. Uh, the, the TVC, of course, is where we went for initial invention disclosure, and they provided me with um, th this first look at is there patentable information? Is there intellectual property? There may or may not be. We're still working on that. But I would have never even thought to, to kind of go there. Uh, they provided an engine funding program that gave us money to begin uh, to, to cooperate in a lean canvas program um, where we're now dealing with an entrepreneurial lead and a group of people who are helping us uh, sort of I, kind of really define the problem, define where the solution lies, and whether or not this is marketable. Uh, the School of Bioengineering uh, with uh, Dr. Peter Lenz, uh, took on the project and gave it to a group of undergraduate students who worked on how to create a system where they could they could communicate the breathing to the video to like the video game that was happening and make that connection and help me with uh, with the, just the dimensions how do you how do you get this device out of the way enough that I could put a mask on the face so engineering was uh, very helpful and had a student a group of students who did this as a as a semester project or a year project I think. Um, in the School of Business with, uh, uh, with Chris here, um, he gave the project to two uh, student teams and they were uh, phenomenal in helping to sort of just define um, uh, sort of the wireframe of the whole idea. Who's going to be the customer? Uh, how, how are you going to present this as a, as a product? Uh, how, what, what's the business model going to look like? And, and I'm just going to interject that whether or not this idea goes anywhere, it's been so fun. And I've gotten to go to all these classes, and I've gotten to learn. And I mean, you know, I'm, today's my birthday. I'm 57 years old. I've never been older than I am right now. But I feel, I feel young. I mean, I feel uh, invigorated again because I get to do all of these great things with all of these young kids at the University of Utah who are actively thinking and generating ideas and making the product better. Um, we've worked with the, uh, with the Gap Lab, which is a phenomenal resource, and it's a collaboration between the Center for, Center for Medical Innovation and the Entertainment Arts and Engineering Group, and that's run by Roger Altizer, I think is here. And um, we got a grant through i which is already mentioned, and that's been phenomenal. Uh, not only does it provide a little bit of seed money, but it also provides mentoring services, educational uh, resources, uh, as weekly class offerings, and uh, it allows you to qualify to apply for a full NSF team grants as you go forward. And that's been created by uh, John Langell, who's who introduced us to today's meeting, started off the whole meeting. In addition, um, the whole Bench to Bedside uh, project, which is also by John, um, is a group of multidisciplinary student teams, and our team's been made up now of some students from the biz school, some students from the, from the engineering school, all collaborating and coming together and, uh, and creating a, a new project on their own and giving this life. Uh, they're in the be Bench to Bedside, they're com there's substantial sums for something, a little project like this, especially for students. 
uh, and um, it's given the, both me and the kids exposure to entrepreneurs and engineers and potential investors. So it's just been a, a, a great project. So that's the project I've been involved with. I've been working with Kai and, and Chris, and thank you. Yeah. Thank you.